Melanie Gray. The Paraguayan Congress hasn't accepted the resignation of President Horacio Cortes because there wasn't a quorum for the sitting. The extraordinary session was adjourned because only 13 of the 45 senators in the upper house were present, while there were 50 deputies of the 80 from the lower house available for the votes. This delays the controversial departure of the president who resigned on Monday to be sworn in as a senator on July 1st. Our correspondent in Paraguay, Osvaldo Zayas, has more details. The Paraguayan Congress was supposed to discuss today the resignation letter from President Horacio Cartes. He wants to be sworn in as an active senator. However, the opposition boycotted the vote by not showing up, so his resignation wasn't discussed. He must remain as president until the Congress accepts his resignation. A group of people demonstrated in front of the Congress to demand that Cartes doesn't violate the Constitution, which states that former presidents cannot be active legislators but must take a place in the upper house as lifetime senators, with the right to speak but no to vote. The opposition says that Cartes will continue to try to make the Congress accept his resignation in order to become legislator, while people said they will continue to demonstrate to make sure the Constitution is respected. The Cuban president, Miguel Diaz-Canel, is in Venezuela for his first official visit. Yes, Canal visited the National Pantheon in Caracas with his wife Liz Cuesta, where they took part in a special ceremony and signed the official visitor's book. The Cuban president said his visit is a show of solidarity with Venezuela, which has been under intense international pressure. Later in the day, Diaz Canal met with President Nicolas Maduro at the Mira Flores Palace. Maduro thanked the, Venezuela, the Cuban president for being a friend to Venezuela and presented him with a special commendation known as the Liberator de America. I am happy for Diaz Canal's visit and for this day of work. I have given the Libertador de America commendation to Diaz Canel, who has assumed the presidency of Cuba in an exemplary process that only the Cuban Revolution could do. I have told Diaz Canel that this commendation is a recognition of a fight, but also a compromise for the future and the new generations. Dear Nicolas, I reiterate my appreciation for the people of Venezuela. I received this commendation in the name of the Cuban people, the Cuban people who enjoyed the achievements of Hugo Chavez, in name of the people of Cuba who have enjoyed your victories, your talent and solidarity against the aggression of the imperialist right, I ratify that no matter the difficulties and challenges Venezuela can count with Cuba today and forever. The Canadian government has announced further sanctions on key Venezuelan figures. Among those hit are Celia Flores, Venezuela's first lady and a member of the National Constituent Assembly. The news release stated that sanctions targeting 14 individuals comes as a response to the May 20th presidential elections with the aim to maintain pressure on the Venezuelan government. And Venezuela's foreign ministry has released a response strongly rejecting the new unilateral coercive measures. In the communique, the foreign ministry referred to the behavior as obsessive on the part of the Canadian government, saying it demonstrates an apparent superiority complex. The note also said that Canadian authorities put forth the policy to avoid losing benefits in trade agreements with the United States. Social movements in the Dominican Republic have urged President Danilo Medina to recognize the outcome of the Venezuelan presidential elections. People gathered at the National Palace to give the president a letter signed by 18 organizations and over 100 people. They say Medina should respect the will of the Venezuelan people and recognize the re-election of President Nicolas Maduro. As a political movement, and as Dominicans, we say that the Venezuelan election held on May 20 was backed by international organizations and was also endorsed by the international delegates who participate as observers. Earlier today, members of the European Parliament protested a speech by Colombian President Juan Manuel Santos. Santos had traveled to Europe to formalize Colombia's membership to NATO as a global partner.
The signs held by leftist parliamentarians said stop NATO interference in Latin America and the Caribbean, with other signs demanding the end to the murder of political leaders and political prisoners in Colombia, specifically calling for the release of FARC leader Jesus Santrich. And another sign urged Santos to stop ignoring the country's peace agreements. Time now for a short break, but join us again after this look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting. Welcome back. Argentina's Chamber of Senators is debating a law to stop the increase in the price of utilities, while President Mauricio Macri is preparing to use his veto against it. Meanwhile, the opposition is working to find alternatives to stop the excessive price increases in Argentina. Our Egaro Esteban has more. We wait to see what happens in the chamber due to the utility increases. The law that was approved in the Chamber of Deputies is now being debated in the upper chamber with the intention to stop the increase of gas, light, and water. They say if it should be increased, it should be proportionate to salaries. There's a political cost that the Mauricio Macri administration wants to avoid because the president has to veto this law if approved by the senators. In this complex time that Argentina is facing, it could have serious political consequences for his administration. The opposition is working to find alternatives for these excessive increases of utilities in Argentina. We thank Ricardo Esteban for that report. Now, in Peru, protests are taking place due to the increase in the cost of living, which, of course, will affect the country's poor the most. Our correspondent, Jaime Herrera, has more. Protests are taking place here in Lima. This one is specifically the nurses' national strike. They are demanding a national budget increase for the health sector, but also a salary increase due to the cost of living, which, according to them, is increasing by the minute. Regions of Cusco, Puno, and Ayacucho are also protesting due to the increase of the cost of living, which mostly affect the poorer sectors of the country. Thanks, Jaime Herrera, for that report. Now, Brazilian oil workers are set to start a 72-hour strike in a new blow to President Michel Temer. This comes as the truck driver strike reaches its 10th day. Our correspondent, Ignacio Limas, has more details from Sao Paulo. 
Saludos estudios en el décimo día. Several roads and highways have been partially unblocked, although in some areas the strike continues. The city of Sao Paulo has started receiving fuel after the military escorted some trucks to fuel dispensers. Long lines of cars wait to buy the fuel that has started to arrive in the city. Lines go back as far as five blocks. The truck driver's strike started 10 days ago in protest of diesel fuel price rises. President Michel Temer agreed to lower the price of fuel, although only for 60 days, in an attempt to end the protest. Despite this, the state oil company Petrobras has announced that fuel prices will go up again. For this reason, oil workers started a 72-hour strike around the country. They are calling for the head of Petrobras to resign, and they're also resisting the privatization of the state company. The U.S. actor Danny Glover has visited the Lula camp in Curitiba outside the federal police headquarters, where the former president, Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva, is being detained. My visit here is not symbolic. I'm here on the behalf of hundreds and thousands and million people in the world who demand that Lula be freed. Yeah. UN ambassador this week to meet the president's, the parents of murdered councillor Mariel Franco. He also met with social movements and government officials to discuss the case. Glover also listened to complaints from residents of a favela in Rio and from representatives of Afro-Brazilian religions who denounced the violations suffered by the community. This visit comes just as Lula de Silva has had his prison rights restored. The decision was made by a court in Sao Paulo that gave Lula all the rights and prerogatives recognized by Brazilian law. Lula lost these rights last May and his lawyers appealed the decision. The former Brazilian president was detained last April after being accused of corruption and sentenced to 12 years and one month in prison. The United Nations Human Rights Office has strong indications that Mexican federal security forces were behind a wave of disappearances in and around the city of Nuevo Laredo between February and May 16th of this year. The UN, UN has documented the disappearances of 21 men and two women, including five minors in Nuevo Laredo in Tamaulipas State. Sorry, A local human rights organization put the number of disappearances at more than 40. The UN Human Rights Office received testimonies that they were allegedly perpetrated by a federal security force, often late at night or very early in the morning. The UN Human Rights Office has documented um, 21 cases of disappearances uh, in Nuevo Laredo, in Tamaulipas, over the past four months. And there are strong indications that members of a federal security force may have been involved in, in their disappearances. And still in Mexico, a group of investigators have said that millions of dollars are being used illegally for election campaigns. <laughs> An analysis of the financing of election campaigns in Mexico, conducted by two independent organizations, has shown the use of money of illegal origin by political parties. Why do we have this great deception? First, for every peso reported by the parties, we discover there are 15 pesos used illegally. In a press conference, the relationship between businessmen who finance campaigns and the candidates was revealed. The candidate does not owe loyalty to ordinary citizens, but to those who finance their campaign. That is not democratic. Analysts have been gathering electoral data since 1994. The aim is to strengthen regulations that call for transparent campaign costs. With these findings, we could contribute to cleaner elections in which people are able to vote for whoever they want to vote. But it's not just vote buying that threatens Mexican democracy. There are also examples of vote blocking, where people are prevented from voting. Se gasta ya más en inhibir el voto. More is spent on inhibiting the vote meaning trying to block voters who have been identified as opposition supporters from arriving to the polling stations. Every six years in the run-up to the election, at least $1,900 million entered Mexico that, according to the study, cannot be controlled. For the most part, the money is destined to buy votes and pay for media coverage. 
The LGBTI community in Ecuador is celebrating the decision by the Constitutional Court to allow a lesbian couple to register their daughter with both mother's surnames. The decision is a milestone in a country where the LGBTI community still fights discrimination. The so-called Satya case began in 2011 when Nicola Ruthon and Helen Brecknell started the process to register their daughter with both their surnames, as is done by heterosexual families. However, despite being born in Ecuador, the child was given a foreign identity card. The court's decision has allowed the girl to have citizenship as well as her mother's surnames. The LGBTI community still demands equal marriage for same-sex couples to be recognized. And Barbados's Mayor Motley today toured the Graham Hall Nature Sanctuary to see firsthand the sewage problem on the island's south coast. After the tour, she said the Grenadian government was approached to assist the Barbados Water Authority in the repair of the leaking sewer lines. The sewage crisis began earlier this year, and Prime Minister Motley called the situation a national emergency. Urgent repairs will now begin under the guidance of the authority, the Coastal Zone Unit, the Environmental Agency and the Barbadian Association of Professional Engineers who will first draft a cabinet paper to recommend solutions to the sewage problem. But what we can't do is treat to this as if it is just something happening offshore. Mm. This is affecting not just the residents and businesses and workers of the South Coast, it is affecting the entire country. We've had more travel advisories on this issue than we've ever had on any other is issue, on crime, on, on, on natural disasters, on anything. So if you have Germany, Canada, UK, USA, USA and everybody, tourism people are here, mm -hmm. saying that they express their concerns about it, are we going to wait till the rainy season and the tourism season comes again to deal with it? No. All Badens will pull up, roll up the sleeves, and we're going to deal with this now. If it means that we can't do some other things because of uh, an availability of funds, so be it. And the Prime Minister of Antigua and Barbuda, Gaston Brown, has extended his congratulations to the newly elected Prime Minister of Barbados, Mia Motley. This means Motley will now assume responsibility for the CARICOM single market and economy in the regional body's quasi-cabinet, a portfolio with which he says he has no doubt she will excel. I'm convinced that this noble project, which has encountered many difficulties and which will continue to be problematic, will be in constructive, practical, and visionary hands with Prime Minister Motley. I take this opportunity to assure her of my firm support as she balances the demands of this important regional role with her pressing domestic obligations. Grenada's Prime Minister, Dr. Keith Mitchell, says lowering the high cost of intra-regional air travel will do much to aid CARICOM's goal of improved Caribbean integration. Mitchell was speaking at the Caribbean Development Bank's annual meeting in St. George's. I have long advocated that we urgently need to reduce the cost of intra-regional air travel. I echo my call made at various heads of government conferences that heads should collectively agree to reduce airline ticket taxes and some of the fees which are attached to intra-regional air travel. I continue to believe that all that we will represent, this will represent a significant installment on the regional integration account. We're going to take a short break now, but join us again after another look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting.
Welcome back. Spanish workers have been protesting against corruption and are demanding better working conditions. Our correspondent Adriana Codoso has the latest from Madrid. Greetings from Madrid. Under the slogan, your corruption is our instability, the eighth stage of the instability march has begun. This march began on May 19th. The march consisted of two main groups, one marching from the north and another from the south of Madrid. They have been traveling in stages through all of Madrid communities. This march protests against job instability. The Popular Party labor reform is making conditions worse for workers. The defense pension platform has joined the protest because they are saying that this instability is holding all public services like education, health, pension, and even culture. A high-ranking North Korean official has arrived in New York to hold talks with U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. During his visit to the U.S., Kim Jong Cole will meet Pompeo to determine whether a meeting between U.S. President Donald Trump and North Korean leader Kim Jong Un, originally scheduled for June 12th, can be restored. Kim Jong Cole has played a front seat role during recent rounds of diplomacy aimed at end ending the nuclear stalemate on the Korean Peninsula. Now let's take another look at the stories making headlines around the world. Zimbabwe President Emerson Mnangagwa announced that elections will take place on July 30th after months of uncertainty. Civilians have expressed mixed reactions to the date, saying that there is not enough time for local authorities to prepare, while others have said that they are ready to vote. This is the first time in the country's history that former leader of nearly 40 years Robert Mugabe, who was removed from power in November last year, will not seek a bid to lead. Lawmakers in the Philippines have passed a bill that will eventually allow self-governance for its Muslim population. The new law is part of a 2014 peace agreement between the Moro Islamic Liberation Front and the government. The law outlines a process for setting up an autonomous territory in a Muslim-majority area often called Bangs of Moro and was pushed forward by President Rodrigo Duarte as urgent in creating lasting peace in the Philippines. Moro brothers and sisters should have the autonomy they deserve and have long fought for. I also believe that such law would finally pave the way for just and lasting peace in Mindanao. French security forces evicted immigrants from a camp along the Canal Saint Denis in Paris and were seen cordoning off the area after displacing over 1,700 people. In a meeting today, Paris Mayor Anne Hidalgo said that 40% of people residing in the camp would be housed in gyms across the city and that it took four months for security forces to plan and carry out the operation. The 2018 Paragliding Pre-World Cup has started in central China. More than 70 paragliders from 12 countries are competing in the tournament which will close on Thursday. The event is an opportunity for the pilots to collect points in their quest to qualify for next year's Paragliding World Cup Championship. The avid flyers are excited to not only test themselves against each other but also to enjoy a bird's eye view of the surrounding area. It's uh, great. It's very uh, big experience for me. Uh, it's a nice place, Linzhou, and um, I'm happy to be here uh, to take this experience because uh, there, there are a lot of uh, um, great sportsmen. <laughs> yeah, so it's very um, useful for me. Uh, We've come to the end of this ne evening's newscast, but before we go, we leave you with some live images from Nicaragua where mothers are gathering for peace after several weeks of violent protests. Live shots there from Nicaragua. We've come to the end of this news brief for these and many other stories. You can find them on our website at telesiotv.net forward slash English. You should also join us on social media, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. For Telesio English, I'm Sunny Gray. Thank you so much for watching. Occidente. Vamos para Rusia que allá está mi gente.